We are on the record in the Gibb matter case D12462464, D. Please confirm your appearances. Good morning, Your Honor. David Wallen, bar number 5098, representing Ms. Gibb, who's present. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Ms. Shancy Kramer, bar number 11545, representing Mr. Gibb, who is also present. Good morning. This is the time set for hearing on plaintiff's motion. Your Honor, it was actually the actual defendant's motion. I'm sorry. Defendant's motion for an order to show cause in the opposition and counter motion. I also did receive a response. So I've had the opportunity to review the papers on file and prepared to rule based on those papers. I do note that there is reference in the opposition and counter motion regarding the need to have an order prepared as it relates to the division. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Judge. I just got back from Chile yesterday and I'm a little bit sick. There is reference to the need to prepare a follow-up order regarding the division of retirement benefits, the defendant's retirement benefits through the military. It references a quadro needing to be prepared, but because they're military benefits, it's really the military uses different terminology. It wouldn't be a quadro. It would be a military benefit division order. They have their specific requirements. So the decree sets out the division, but it is something that is important that's prepared to preserve and protect the division of those benefits. So that's something that does need to be taken care of. And I retain jurisdiction to oversee that. But as it relates to the underlying motion, again, I've read the papers. Counsel, do you have anything to add on behalf of the defendant beyond what's in the papers? No, just that the decree is pretty clear on this, Your Honor. And in the opposition, there's a number of issues that I don't see as even being properly before the court. There's a bunch of extraneous requests in there that had nothing to do with my motion for an order to show cause and nothing to do with what was in my motion. I don't think a number of those issues are even properly here today. Okay. All right, Counsel, do you have anything to add beyond what's in the papers? I do have one thing to add, Your Honor. Actually, because I was out of the country, I didn't really have an opportunity to get a bunch of documents and submit them to other parties. But I do have correspondence here from a lender that shows on three different occasions she attempted to get the refinancing done. However, was not able to accomplish it because the VA compromise has not been completed yet. Your Honor, that is... One at a time. You'll be allowed to respond. All right, Your Honor. So I haven't attempted to hand those out yet, Judge. But the plaintiff's, the defendant's claim that she hasn't attempted to refinance these houses is just totally fallacious. That's the first thing I'd like to point out. The second thing I'd like to point out, Your Honor, is that the VA compromise to short sell the house, as we stated in our opposition, when they short sold the house at the close of escrow, the parties, being the husband and wife here, paid nothing to close escrow. The short sale was done by the bank. And as is traditional in short sales, and Judge, I've done hundreds of these because I used to be in a house at Nevada Title, and I'm mostly a real estate lawyer. Sometimes I get drug over here to family court against my better judgment. But in any event, the point is that when the short sale was closed, the buyer, the sellers had to pay nothing to the short sale. The closing cost, the payment to the title company, the payment for the recording and all that stuff was paid by either the buyer or by the bank. The bank gets a net amount after a short sale minus whatever their share of the closing cost were. So in fact, it does say in the decree of divorce that parties will split the closing cost. But in this case, Judge, when the Villiers house sold, there were no closing costs to the sellers, being Mr. and Mrs. Gibb. The closing costs were borne by the buyer and borne by the bank. Now, as to the $84,000, that is a post-close of escrow issue, Judge. When we negotiated this divorce decree, there was no understanding that these parties would end up with any sort of a liability on the order of $84,000. My client wanted to keep the house, Judge. The house negative cash flowed $200,000. I'm going to object. Judge, it's all my decision. This is basic law school evidence class. Under the parole evidence rule, if there was something that was talked about in the negotiations, this is right here. This is the final sum of those negotiations. He's bringing in stuff that is not here. Well, and I understand. Listen, this is argument. And nothing that's been shared is any different from what I've read in the paperwork. That's exactly right, Your Honor. But I, listen, it's argument. I just want to finish this one point, if I may. That's all I have, is this one point. The point I want to make is this, Judge. 
he has the ability to get a VA loan to buy a house. That is absolutely bed. not true. You know, Judge, she'll have her chance. If she wants to rebut what I say, I didn't interrupt her when she was talking. Again. If I could say what I'd like to say, and yeah, she can listen, she we need to. to maintain professional decorum. It's one at a time in this courtroom. I do not want interruptions. You'll both have the opportunity to fully state your case to the court, but I do not want any interruptions in this court. Okay, so please proceed I, I and I was conclude. Speaking, you know, yes, I'd you like were. Finish my point. My point is this, Judge. My point is, is that the close of escrow occurred and the sellers, being the Gibbs, paid nothing because the bank bore the seller's expenses. When you read the decree of divorce it says they will split the cost of the close of escrow, that's what we're talking about, Judge. The VA loan is he, as a military member, can get a loan through the Veterans Administration. It's up to a certain amount, I believe approximately $400,000, Your Honor. What happens is because they short sold this house and it was a VA loan, the short sale is deducted from how much he can borrow the next time he wants to get a VA loan. So the result of that is, Your Honor, is that he can still get a VA loan, just not as large a VA loan. And the fact is, Judge, it's just common sense here. Why in the world would they agree to short sell a house that's going to create an immediate $84,000 liability for them instead of just losing $200 a month? It would take them 20 years to recover that $84,000 that they now have to pay. The fact is, Judge, is what the defendant proposes they do is that they repay this $84,000 so he can restore his maximum VA loan amount for a loan he may never take. He may never buy another house. He may go to live in a foreign country. He may do something else. Who knows what he may do? It makes no sense at all, Judge, to pay $84,000 in real money now in order to restore a potential loan amount. And that's what we're talking about, Judge. The $84,000 was not a close of escrow cost. The escrow was closed. They didn't pay anything. This is a post-close of escrow issue relating to his VA loan ability going forward. That's the only point I want to make, Judge. Okay. Your Honor, um, as far as the VA loan goes, they are misstating how the VA system works. He doesn't get to just say, okay, this $84,000, I can't borrow that. That has to be paid back on the front end. The plaintiff is suggesting that gets tacked on at the back end of the loan. That's not how it works. He can't borrow anything until that $84,000 is restored to the VA. Now, there's no way they would have known it would have been an $84,000 deficit going into a short sale. So to say that that was even foreseen in the negotiation process is just simply not true. The other thing, Your Honor, is he keeps referencing escrow and splitting escrow costs. That's not what the decree says. The, the decree, which page 7, lines 19 through 21, specifically says, if that is available, the parties will sell the house through a short sale. If the bank will waive the deficiency, which is what we're talking about here, Your Honor, is the $84,000 deficiency, or negotiate it down to an amount the parties agree to settle for, and each would be responsible for one half of this cost. It doesn't mention escrow or closing costs. It specifically mentions a deficiency, which is exactly what we're talking about here. This is a deficiency. Now, the, where he just said he's a real estate, uh, real estate attorney. She's a licensed real estate agent. And they're coming into court intentionally misstating the way the VA system works. The $84,000 doesn't come off the max amount that he's allowed to borrow. He can never access the VA home loan system until that $84,000 is paid back. She was represented by counsel, and she negotiated, and she agreed that she would be responsible for one half of the cost of the deficiency, which it specifically references. It's right there. Who is the deficiency owed to? The VA. Okay, let me ask you, because that paragraph contemplates three options. Right. Number one is VA compromise. Um, that's the first option. Second, the second option... Um, second alternative, is it's called, is to sell a house to the current tenants on an IATD contract, which wasn't pursued. That really doesn't come into play. The third option, which is where this whole, that the language that you've cited comes into play, the third alternative is to determine if the bank will agree to a short sell and waive the deficiency. If the party, if that is available, the parties will sell the house through a short sale. If the bank will waive the deficiency or negotiate it down to an amount the parties agree to settle for. And what happens, Your Honor, is the VA has guaranteed that loan. So when the bank short sold the home, 
they just go back to the VA and the VA paid them the deficiency, which is the $84,000. So the bank got all its money. What, but what that has done is now Kristen can never access the VA home loan program until he repays that deficiency. So he will never be able to get another VA loan until that's returned to the VA. Okay. So the, the VA is essentially acting as HUD would, where they guarantee the loans um, and they pay the bank back. So now the bank's got their money, they're happy, they're not pursuing anyone for a deficiency. The deficiency now goes, the VA has it. But it, it's not as though the VA would ever come after the defendant for that amount. No, it's he, just if he wanted to access a VA loan in the future, you're saying he would not be entitled to pursue the VA loan because there's an 84,000 VA compromise on his record, so right. to speak. Right, and it has to be paid back or he can't use the, the benefit. Okay, anything else, counsel? Just on the, as far as the other two homes go, Your Honor, um, it, it, the terms of the decree, again, uh, plaintiff was represented by counsel and the terms are very clear. It says if she doesn't um, refinance the homes that he gets half of each of the homes. Um, this is the embroidery and the Ash Street home. Um, and Your Honor, um, as far as some of the suggestions made by the plaintiff in her opposition, she suggested that um, the short sale had negatively impacted her credit. That short sale didn't on the on the. Um, with the VA compromise on that home. That didn't take place until November. Um, the six months expired in December. So from the time of this decree, which was in June, until the very end of November, there was nothing negative on her credit. And the bad credit reports didn't, from, the sh from the VA compromise didn't hit either credit report until December, which by then, the six months had expired. So to suggest that somehow this short sale negatively impacted her ability to refinance the embroidery in the Ash Street house is not true because the information was not on her credit report until after the six months had expired. Okay. All right, I do have to uh, respond. Now she's making my argument. It's great, Judge. She agrees now that it was impossible for them to know that they could have this $84,000 issue at the time they closed. That We agree with that. That's what I was saying earlier. And not that they have to pay it back, just that if he wants to get another VA loan, he has to pay it back. The VA is not going to come after them. And, and Judge, I don't claim to know the rules about the VA, but it's my understanding, based on what I've been able to talk to a couple of JAGs that are now practicing attorneys, that all it does is reduce the amount of VA loan he can get in the future, not eliminate his ability to get a VA loan. I don't, you know, that's a question of fact, Judge. If we need to set this for an evidentiary hearing, we can certainly do that. As to the other two houses, Judge, I have correspondence here from a lender saying that she tried in July to get a loan, she tried in December to get a loan, and she tried again earlier this year to get a loan, and the VA has not completed the process yet. Such What I believe happened here was there was something that neither party could have possibly contemplated, Judge. There was a mutual mistake here. They didn't know that when the sale of the Villiers home happened, that it would take several months for the VA to complete the process that they go through. And in the meantime, the loan was going to be shown as delinquent. And that's exactly what happened, Judge. Her credit has been harmed because for the last nine, it's still to this day, and, uh, is being shown as delinquent. And the lender is saying that once they update the credit report to show that the loan is paid in full, because it is paid in full, the, the close of escrow happened several months ago, the house is paid in full, they're not obligated for a dime to anybody on that house, but it still doesn't show on her credit report as paid in full. What I think happened here was something that neither one of them could have contemplated, that, that it wasn't going to be possible for her to refinance the houses in six months because of the VA process. In fact, she has good credit otherwise. In fact, she could refinance the houses otherwise. And in fact, this letter from the lender says, as soon as that shows paid in full on your credit report, come on back and we'll refinance you. So the fact is, Judge, is that they're now singing my song. He doesn't have to pay the 84. It makes absolutely no sense to pay back a real $84,000 today to ostensibly be able to get a loan at a future date that you may never use when you're not obligated or under any legal obligation to pay that money back and the VA is not going to come after you for it. That was never contemplated in this, in this divorce settlement. And on top of that, Judge, as far as the, the two loans go, she'll get the houses refinanced as soon as she can. They were never taken out of title. He's still in title on them. 
And, and if, if he wants them, we're okay with that, Judge, because my prediction is that this housing market's got some more rough time in front of it in Las Vegas. And if he wants to stay on the hook for three or $400,000 worth of liability that she was willing to take exclusively, we're okay with that. He's going to gain about half of about $300 a month, but we're going to ask the court to order him to come out of pocket for half of the expenses that she re spent repairing those two properties, which is roughly $5,000, Judge. So we will provide that to the court in, in due process, the expenses that she paid. And as to our counter motion, the only thing I would close with, Judge, is that, uh, again, our, our words are twisted in this response that, that they're saying that my client is bad-mouthing the husband to the child. That's exactly the opposite of what we said in our opposition, Judge. What we said was that our client doesn't want to bad-mouth the husband to the child. My client doesn't want to have to explain the divorce to the child. The child can go to the counselor. The child developed a good relationship with the counselor judge. The, judge and the child enjoyed going to the counselor, and the counselor can take up those tough issues without putting mom or dad in the middle, without having the possibility of that occurring. The child, since she stopped going to the counseling, has come into mother's room every single night and asked to go to bed with mother again, which she wasn't doing when she was going to the counselor. The fact is we believe the counseling is beneficial. What happened was the child made some comment about having been sexually touched, and she reported it, and that caused an investigation to happen. We, my client and I, took the child over to a counselor, the, the, up to the, the building right behind us here, and they determined that it was not an actual event, that there was a misunderstanding, and they canceled the thing. We worked hard with Mr. Gibb. I actually in, introduced Mr. Gibb to an attorney that he hired to us to sit through that process because we didn't believe that happened either. And the fact of the matter is, Judge, because of that one circumstance, they're now saying, we don't want to go to this counselor anymore. This counselor's no good. Well, I think the counselor is good for the child, and I think there's demonstrable evidence that the counselor's good for the child, and we see no reason to change that. And we would ask the court to reaffirm that that child, if she's benefiting from the counseling, in the opinion of the primary custodian of the, of the child, the mother, then that counseling should be restored. And as far as Wednesday night goes, taking the child to the Wednesday night church services, my client is still taking the child. He just simply refuses to, even though that's what we agreed to in the decree of divorce. Okay. Your Honor, uh, first of all, I'm going to object to all of that because it's not properly before the court. The plaintiff has counsel. If she wants to bring this issue, she can file her own motion. Um, there's nothing prohibiting her from doing that. That said, um, there's nothing prohibiting her from picking a different counselor either. Given what the counselor's behavior, the fact that she didn't even investigate properly, she made allegations against a father that were completely unfounded. CPS dropped it immediately. Uh, it took two seconds worth of investigation for them to see that nothing had happened. I wouldn't want that counselor talking to my family members either. Pick a different counselor. There, there's nothing wrong there. But they did say in their opposition that she cannot even talk to her own child about daddy without bad mouthing him. That's so maybe the issue. Jeff, Jeff, no, Jeff, no, no listen, opposition. listen. Hey. One at a time. I'm sorry. I've, That's, I just hate it when my words are mistaken. If, if a grown woman cannot even discuss an, an event that took place nine months ago with a child, maybe the problem is not with the child. Maybe the problem is with her. Um, that said, Your Honor, to address some of the issues that are properly before this court, um, as a veteran myself, I can tell you, the JAG doesn't work for the VA. So I don't know what a former JAG would have anything to do with the VA process. Um, Kristen here has called the VA and has talked to the people that work on the VA compromises. He did this just last week. Um, and so what I have represented you, to you today, that he cannot access the VA loan system until that $84,000 is repaid, is the truth. Um, as far as the plaintiff not knowing that it was going to take a long time to sell these houses to do this, um, the plaintiff is a real estate professional. Um, she knows that these things take a long time. They're the ones that put in here that this would take place within six months. That, she was represented by counsel. He didn't even have an attorney there. She was represented by counsel, and she signed off on, she agreed to the six-month deadline. Now that the six-month deadline has come and gone, and he's asking for his rights, per the decree that she and her attorney drafted, she's complaining. That's not how it works. She agreed to it. She signed off on it. Um, as far as there being a mutual mistake, Your Honor, there was no mutual mistake. She knew it was going to take time. She put in here that it took six months. Furthermore, Your Honor, her parents are millionaires, and they went and bought her a new home. 
If she wanted to comply with the decree, her parents could have refinanced the embroidery house for her and she could still live there. She chose to have mommy and daddy go buy her a great big house and she chose to rent out the embroidery house as an income property. And now that Chris is asking for his rights, per the decree that she agreed to, represented by counsel, she wants to complain that he has somehow done something to her. He didn't do anything. The bad credit reports didn't start until the short sale closed out at the end of November. They didn't hit their credit reports until December. The six months had already expired by then. Okay, um, I, I make the no. I, I don't need any more. Uh, again, everything everything that I'm hearing was very adequately briefed in the papers that have been filed. I really haven't learned in, anything more from oral argument because you both briefed the court uh, uh, extremely well in the paperwork that was filed. Uh, so I'm 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 prepared to rule. And this matter is governed by the terms of the decree of divorce. That's the controlling order that was entered on June 20th, 2012. There's no basis for the court to set that aside. That's not the nature of the request. I don't have any jurisdiction to modify the terms of the decree of divorce. And in many respects, is self-executing, uh, uh, self if you will, or self-effectuating to a certain extent. Uh, those terms control where I'm at. Uh, even as it relates, and the only item I'm really dealing with as it relates to the counter motion, when it uh, deals with the counseling, that's even covered by the provisions of the decree of divorce. It is further ordered to judgment and decreed that the minor child, Zariah Gibb, will attend individual counseling with a counselor selected by plaintiff and covered by the defendant's medical insurance. Period. It's covered by the language of your decree. The plaintiff selects the counselor that Zariah is going to attend, and, and uh, that counseling should continue. It does appear and sound as though counseling is necessary, and the plaintiff may select the counselor to be used for that purpose. With, with respect to the property issues, and again, those are adequately covered by virtue of the decree of divorce. We've spent some time to discuss and debate uh, some of those provisions, but the... Uh, um, the embroidery and the Ash Street properties, um, are, are there are specific provisions that both provide, and I don't find that there's a basis for the court to issue an order to show cause or make any findings of contempt, because the orders are very specific. If the plaintiff is unsuccessful in removing defendant's name from the loan, plaintiff will file a quick claim deed to convey one half interest in the property back to defendant. Now understand, it, I, I always cringe at the sight of re-entangling parties together. But that's your controlling order, and that's, the, that's what the two of you agreed to, and, and that does control, and it does create some re-entanglement. Um, but it very specifically states, if the plaintiff is unsuccessful in refinancing, it doesn't matter to me um, why, what the reasons were, the, the, the issue about the VA compromise and how that may or may not have affected the plaintiff's uh, credit and the timing of when that all took place, it really is of no consequence because the bottom line is the language of the decree controls uh, that uh, if, it's, if the plaintiff were unsuccessful, then essentially it reverts back to the parties having equal ownership. In this instance, because there was never a quick claim deed filed, it doesn't appear that there's any necessary quick claim deed at this point. The parties maintain a one-half interest, which means you're each in equally entitled to uh, any uh, rents or profits from the property, and you're each equally responsible for any costs. So it really boils down to an accounting issue as to both of those assets. So the defendant is entitled to one-half interest in those assets, one-half of the rent subject to one-half of the expenses. So that accounting should be um, exchanged. Um, the uh, With respect to the... Uh, Villiers Road property in Washington. Again, the language is fairly specific and it proposed three alternatives and I went through that on the record a little bit. The second alternative really doesn't come into play, but there were distinct alternatives offered, the first being the VA compromise. And that language is very specific um, that uh, if the defendant qualifies for the same, the parties agree to short sell the house and take the VA compromise and split any costs associated with the same. Then it proceeds to the second alternative. The third alternative is, uh, contains additional language that specifically refers to the deficiency. And I view that as the defic any deficiency judgment that's pursued by the bank. But I don't see that tied to that first alternative. The first alternative just <coughs> references the VA compromise as being an option. So I don't find that there's a basis to order any type of reimbursement as it relates to the VA compromise. Um, 
and that, that VA compromise was limited simply to the costs of that process, which from the discussion we've had appears to have been handled either through the VA process or by the buyer. I don't find that it, it invokes the deficiency judgment provisions that are set forth as part of the third alternative, which the parties never pursued. That third alternative, where there potentially is a deficiency judgment, is where I would have expected the parties to engage in a discussion and make that determination. Do we want to have that? Uh, do, is, that some, is that an option? Is that an amount we can negotiate? So I, I, don't, I don't find that that was triggered uh, by way of the VA compromise, so I'm not making any awards of any amounts or judgments. Again, I find that the, uh, the uh, language of the decree of divorce is self-effectuating in that regard. Um, as you go forward and, and getting back to, to your, your daughter, and, and I know this has been a lot more about the property, um, and I've touched on the counseling that your daughter needs. She needs to be insulated from any differences the two of you have. Um, when I saw a reference to any type of bad mouthing and, and not, there's been no suggestion that that has taken place, but that's something I cringe at as well. There's no reason to bad mouth any, either parent to the child. She doesn't need that. She needs to know that mom loves her and dad loves her, and that's it. Whatever differences the two of you have may, may have had, whatever dispute you have as to how the relationship ended, that's none of her business, and keep her out of that. She just needs to be able to, to love each of you, and she needs permission. She needs permission from mom to love dad and permission from dad to love mom, and, and leave it at that. And her world will be so much better as long as she's not selfishly drawn into any disputes between the two of you. She doesn't need that in her life. So those are my uh, findings and orders. Do we need an, uh, Each party is to bear their own fees and costs, uh, given the relief that, that uh, has been uh, ordered at this time. Uh, is there any need for an order to be prepared, or will the minutes suffice? I'll be happy to prepare if you want me to, Your Honor. I'll also provide an accounting of the expenses and the income from both properties and, and get that to both the court and to the other side. Okay. All right. Uh, if you'll prepare. A couple of weeks to do that, so I'm just getting back into town, and I'm sure i got a pile of stuff on my desk. Yeah. Okay. If you'll prepare and submit to counsel for a signature. Okay. All right. Thank you for your appearances. Thank you,